This is the tallest and newest onshore wind turbine in England and all the money from it is going to one of the poorest communities. Welcome to the show and this week we're looking at whether there's a new dawn, a fair wind if you like, behind community energy and could this place have the blueprint for it. Also on the show. Temperatures soar across Europe again after extreme heat led to 60,000 deaths last summer. We'll look at the silent hazard of underground climate change lurking under the world's major cities. And one million down, seven million to go. Kew Gardens hits a major landmark in its bid to digitise all the specimens it's amassed since Darwin's day. This neighbourhood, just on the outskirts of Bristol, has around 3,000 households, many of them on low incomes. So much, so normal, but it's the birthplace of something pretty extraordinary. The people behind these walls are getting pennies from heaven. I like you got it in big letters what you're yeah, about. Yeah, <laughs> ambition is believing in yourself even when no one else in the world does. And that's Very what we've good. done. It took an off the wall idea to make it happen. I was sat in a pub with another resident um, after one or two many beers, perhaps, um, and he came up with the idea we need to deliver a wind turbine. Um, I said, listen, you've had far too much to drink, get your coat, we're going home. Um, and the rest, I guess, is history. The community here in Lawrence Weston scratched together the money to build a massive turbine. They battled to get start-up finance from local and central government and then sourced the bulk of the £5 million they needed from open market loans. Now the right weather yields a return for both the investors and the community. So how do you feel when the wind blows, like it is now? I've never felt so in love with windy weather as I do today. <laughs> because? Because um, that's turning a, a, the largest wind turbine in England that we happen to own as a community group. Um, and by those blades turning, means that we're generating economic sustainability for our impoverished community. And here it is, the most powerful onshore wind turbine in England, capable of delivering electricity for 3,000 homes, taller than Big Ben, and somewhat ironically, right next door to a gas-fired power station. There were just two onshore wind turbines built in England last year, although the government does seem to be softening its attitude towards them. The key to getting them built is getting the community involved, not thrusting these turbines on them. There's a phrase in Denmark where they say, uh, your own pig poo doesn't smell. And, uh, and I think that's true with, with this uh, turbine. When you look at a turbine and you own it, uh, as opposed to looking at a turbine when you don't own it, you don't see a blot on the li landscape, you see something that you really want. And without wishing to mix yeah. my farm animals, yeah. it's then a cash cow, isn't yeah. it? Absolutely, and, and this is going to go on for generations, and we're going to build an energy learning zone just here, so future generations can learn the skills for net zero. David is hoping to prove that this model can work and roll it out on a much bigger scale. We're going to develop 10 more and then we're going to look at how we can look at across the country. People want onshore wind, so we haven't got a problem with that. It's just getting that development finance and we can roll the next generation of community turbines. We will be developing the blueprint for onshore wind and it to be community led. This is about community energy and energy sovereignty, about owning the asset and the benefits coming back to the communities. But it's not just about wind. There are different ways of owning part of your own renewable energy cash cow. This cooperative solar farm is based in the fields next to Lawrence Weston. I was one of a number of people who were just sort of volunteers who decided we wanted to get hands-on in terms of renewable energy generation. Rather than leave it to other people, we said, OK, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, and so we, we started off by raising money to do some rooftop solar on community buildings. Well, now we have about 10 megawatts worth of, of solar and that's, that's enough to power over 3,000 homes. Individuals can buy shares of these solar farms and then get a portion of the money they make. There are over 300 schemes like this running across the country. For this solar cooperative, the rest of the profits go to community projects in Bristol. It gets me up in the morning. It can be so easy to get so down on, on the climate crisis when actually there's loads of things we could be doing. And this is one way we can do, we, we can do it. So I'm intrigued about those orchards. For the Lawrence Western neighbourhood, energy projects are not just from the community, they are for the community. 
Mark sold the idea on practical local actions, not global aspirations. Just beyond those trees there will be the brand new community hub. Um, within that community hub, we're open to deliver um, a Renewable Energy Skills Academy and a Modern Methods of Construction Academy um, in the hope that when and if a just energy transition happens, um, our residents are best placed to take advantage of that and they're not further left behind. When we went out to consult the community on climate, we were met with slam doors. They weren't interested. They've got more pressing issues today. Um, they, they know the ice caps are melting thousands of miles away, but they also know the ice in their freezers are melting now, today. So we, we took that as a note. Um, we realised that what we were trying to deliver, community development, is exactly climate action except we were coming from it at a different angle. The, the climate activists um, don't want to see gas being burnt. They don't want to see uh, carbon being created. We don't want to see our money being burnt. We don't want to see debt being created. Here, fighting climate change and fighting poverty are the same battle. Now, after the hottest June on record, temperatures in July have taken a bit of a dip, even going below the seasonal norm. But in Europe, we've just learnt that last year's excess heat caused 60,000 deaths and temperatures are on the rise once again. The dark red on this map shows the extreme heat across the south of the continent, with temperatures of up to 42 degrees forecast by Monday. That's seven degrees above normal for this time of year. Average temperatures in Europe, driven by climate change, have risen more than two degrees compared to the second half of the 19th century. That's twice the global rate. Our energy and climate change correspondent Hannah Thomas-Peter is in Athens, where tourists and residents alike are really feeling the heat. Well, it's absolutely baking on the streets of Athens, pushing up towards 40 degrees and many more days of this left as this high pressure area gets trapped over southern Europe and, and northern Africa. And this city's used to the heat, but this is a particularly severe heat event. And so they're putting in place lots of measures to make sure the population stays safe, particularly older people and the very young. And let's show you inside one of the cooling centres that they've opened in order to keep the most vulnerable populations safe. I'll just shut the door here to keep all the cold air in. We're joined by the Deputy Mayor of Athens, respons responsible for uh, these cooling centres. Um, tell me, how important are these cooling centres and what service do they provide? It seems that they're extremely important. It's something that we really didn't know about, as you can understand, because uh, it's been quite a recent phenomenon. Uh, the heat waves, these, these kind of heat waves are quite a recent phenomenon for Greece. I mean, we used to have uh, very small ones, once in every, I don't know, two years or, so, or something. And uh, we all understand that this is, has become an issue, uh, global warming, etc., etc. We all talk about that, but we've never felt it uh, on, our, in our, on our skin. Uh, so it's been so important to have these spaces for people, for vulnerable people. And when I say vulnerable people, I'm talking about uh, the elderly, I'm talking about the homeless, I'm talking about families uh, or people that are living alone or they don't have uh, cooling devices at their, at their uh, faces, at their spaces. So we've seen that uh, little by little it's getting even more important uh, to have these kind of spaces and to have people there that actually can give an advice or only and maybe only to feel that there's someone there for you if something happens to you or if you feel uh, whatever uh, difficult and um, yeah. Is it a, a, good, a good sign that actually it's not that busy here right now? People are potentially at home being sensible or are you worried that people aren't using it? Uh, it's either a good sign because uh, of what you're saying or is it a um, disturbing sign because people don't know about it even, though, even if we started communicating I think uh, a week ago. Um, but we can understand that since we are not used to dealing with the heat as an emergency. It, you can see if you walk around Athens, you see all people are outside and they're going to their uh, work and things that they're doing. Even, even I saw people having coffee outside in the heat. So uh, the, the warning for me, the, the, the very difficult thing is that people don't really understand how, how important it is to deal with these kind of situations 
Thank you so much for speaking to us here on Sky News. This is just one measure that the government's putting in place. Another is asking people not to be outside through the heat of the day. Very concerned that outdoor workers protect themselves. Um, there's obviously also been some extra firefighters deployed watching the conditions around wildfires um, very carefully indeed. But an interesting thought there about how even in Greece, they are not yet fully prepared for dealing with heat as an ongoing emergency through these peak summer months. Well, Hannah out there has got extraordinary weather and it looks like it's only going to get hotter. Back here we've got the deck chairs, but we don't have the weather to go with it. As we can see, I'm with our science correspondent Thomas Moore because we're going to talk about some extraordinary weather uh, in, uh, in India and North America. Yeah, much higher rainfall there. Uh, let's start in northern India where you can see phenomenal rain. Delhi had uh, 153 millimetres of rain in 24 hours. That's the highest Delhi amount for July in 40 years. It's sweeping away houses, it's bridges, uh, and sadly there have been several deaths too. You can see uh, the ferocity of it. Uh, phenomenal. Of course, in mountainous areas, everything gets channeled down valleys, so you're going to get very fast flowing water. And of course, in places like India, people People using every bit of available land tend to build their, their houses uh, on the river banks. But even in Vermont, in, in well-built urban areas, uh, you've got uh, rivers which are, are burst their bank as banks and, and are also flooding huge areas. And President Biden has declared a national state of emergency. And with both these things, are people linking it to, to, to climate change? Absolutely. That uh, clearly rainfall uh, happens, but in uh, with warmer atmospheres, holds more moisture, and that moisture has got to come down. Now, this picture of a lake isn't actually to do with rainfall, is it? It's to do with this really interesting thing about whether we are now in a geological era called the Anthropocene, in effect that we are changing the planet so much that it'll sort of be noticeable in millennial history. What happened on that this week? Yeah, so th this is Crawford Lake, which is near Toronto in, in Canada, and it's special because it's relatively small surface area, but extremely deep. That means that the sediment that comes down over millennia doesn't get disturbed, doesn't get stirred up. So when you're sort of taking a core down through all that mud, you get a, a, a timeline of everything that's, that's fallen into it. Now, what scientists have been trying to do is identify in that where is the point that human activity becomes visible, not just in Crawford Lake, but globally, uh, and that, that that would become an indelible marker for human activity. And they've identified it as in the 1950s. Right, now I'm intrigued by that, because we hear a lot about the Anthropocene and how we're affecting the planet so much today with extinctions and climate change. But if you're talking about the 1950s, what is it about? It seems rather late, doesn't it? Because, of course, farming, yeah. then in the Industrial Revolution, those clearly are impacts of humans on the planet. But it actually becomes easier to see with fallout from nuclear bomb testing. So they are looking at plutonium, a radioactive uh, marker that's quite easy to detect uh, even after uh, several decades and probably centuries or millennia to come. And that's like a, a red flag. This is human activity because it is a man-made element. But the timescale here is, is, is really daunting, isn't it? Because I gather there's a bit of argument about actually whether we'll be able to see these things in almost millions of years, which is the definition of a geological era. Look, this is hugely controversial because clearly we want to see whether we are having this effect on the planet that we're going to leave behind us, even after our civilization yeah. is, is long gone. Yeah. And yes, it's, it's, it's plutonium, it's microplastics, it's ash from coal-fired power yeah. stations. All these things are being laid down in the rock strata that might persist, but will it last the test of time? And we don't know because plutonium does wither away, it decays. Something much more short term and much more simple. <laughs> um, I gather they've been releasing more beavers in the yeah, UK. Yeah, this is in Northumberland on a National Trust uh, state up there. Uh, they've released four more beavers. And of course, they are brilliant landscape engineers. So this is part of climate resilience. So not only will they uh, create uh, dams in waterways that provide lush wetlands, draws in lots more wildlife, but also it slows down the flow of water. So in times of drought, there's more water left. In times of flood, it slows down the amount of rain going down the River. So it really helps when talking about the climate of the future. Thomas Moore, thank you very much. No time to tell you that I'm one of the few people in the country that's been bitten by a beaver. You can look that up on YouTube if you want. If we stay out here much longer, we're going to be in our own uh, beaver dam. Um, time for a break now. When we come back, we'll be looking at how heat is being generated underground. The climate of the ground beneath our buildings is actually changing. See you then.
Welcome back to the show and you find me in the bowels of the building because we are looking at the fact that it often gets hot underground, driven by all our man-made structures beneath the earth. Now, a new report is out saying this could threaten the buildings above. And I've been speaking to the report's author, that's Alessandro Rotaloria from Northwest Illinois University. My study reveals that the ground underneath the city is deforming, uh, is moving. As a result of a phenomenon often called underground climate change, um, also termed subsurface urban heat islands, that basically consists of rising temperatures in the subsurface of cities. The rationale is that soils, rocks, um, concrete, and materials at large deform when subjected to temperature variations. And so as a result of this change in the climatic conditions underground, um, soils and rocks deform beneath us, and so also the foundations that rest upon them deform. And what is the heat source that's causing this increased warmth? So we humans produce heat, like release heat when we move. When trains in subway tunnels break, they release heat, at least most of the trains. Uh, lighting systems release heat. So there are, there are a myriad of heat sources uh, in underground environments. And um, these environments slowly diffuse heat in their surroundings and so in soils and rocks. And also heat networks. I mean, you know, a lot of cities have things like district heating and pipes running underground. Does that have an effect? Absolutely. Yeah. Sewage, um, sewage networks, uh, everything you, that you can think of. It's really interesting. And you, you've kind of put all these together and, and, and quantified them and they add, they add up, do they? Correct. Yeah, they add up. So you can consider that around each of these heat sources, there is the formation of a, you could call it a bubble of heat. Uh, and so the denser and the closer together will be these heat sources, the more pronounced uh, will become these bubbles of heat. Um, and so you can really consider that there is a change in the climatic conditions underground. The, the second driver is a, is a so-called diffuse driver uh, that consists in the surface component of uh, urban heat islands, which are also called meteorological urban heat islands. The idea is that construction materials typically employed for building envelopes absorb heat coming from solar radiation and again anthropogenic activity and they release that heat at night so that's why in c cities are typically warmer than the surrounding rural areas so the hot tarmac the hot buildings part of that is is, is going down as well and how big is this kind of deformation this reshaping of the underground world how, how damaging can it be i suppose so um, based on the results of uh, our research we, um, we have been able to quantify that um, Ground deformations can be particularly complex. We can have soil layers that expand, but also contract upon heating. Uh, and um, these ground deformations are associated with ground movements uh, and specifically vertical displacements exceeding 10 millimeters. Now, the reason why this is significant is because in civil engineering, it's uh, renowned that vertical displacements of that order of magnitude can become problematic for the function of structures and infrastructures. And just very briefly, I know in some cities, I think London is one, we also seen uh, things like clay drying out and shrinkage as a, as a result of that. So presumably this could be compounding on top of other factors underground. Exactly. Absolutely. Yes. So um, especially in cities such as London, where uh, there is uh, under, an underground climate change, there is a subsurface urban heat islands and there are many phenomena going on. Uh, this is one that is likely to exacerbate what is already happening. Thanks very much, Alessandro. Absolutely fascinating. Now, from deep below ground to the green world above, the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew have been collecting specimens from around the world for hundreds of years. Even Charles Darwin gave them a few. They reckon they got 8 million specimens and they started to digitise them back in 2021. Well, they've now nearly done the first million and we sent our own Mickey Carroll down to have a chat with them. This is one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. For hundreds of years, Kew Gardens have been amassing millions of specimens of plants and fungi and conserving them to study. Now they're on a mission to modernise. We're trying to digitise all our herbarium specimens held in these buildings. The cupboards you see around you contain specimens from all over the globe. We've just imaged our millionth specimen. We've got six million more to do, but we're well on track. 
and we really want to get this information out. We want to essentially turn this building inside out so the information we hold can be used by people worldwide for whichever environmental issue they're interested in. Dr Sarah Phillips is one of more than 300 people getting this collection online. So what do you actually mean by digitising a plant? Oh yeah, so um, what we mean by that is capturing the information that you would find on a herbarium specimen and then imaging it and producing a high resolution image. So then you can start looking at the details of the characters and from the image, you know, a taxonomist can use it for their research. So here we have a sample of herbarium specimens. Um, so they're really sort of pl dried plant material that have been mounted on herbarium sheets, usually kind of glued on. And also, as well as the plant itself, you'll have like label information, and that will be what, the, what species the plant is, where it's uh, from, who collected it, and when it was collected. And so, yeah, here we've got a large selection. You know, we've got actually some that we've been collected from um, in Darwin's collected. So these are one from the Straits of Magellan, which is an orchid. So, you know, we have, I think it's around 1834. So we just have a, a, a huge variety. So that's of a plant that Darwin has touched. Yes, yeah, yeah, he would have like, yeah, collected it and been on the beagle with it round the, round the world. And how does something go from this piece of paper to something that someone on the other side of the world can study for their conservation science? So let's have a look at the imaging station. So the idea behind this is that we take high resolution images that then a botanist would be able to zoom in and have a look at the characters and be able to check the identification. This gorgeous species is part of the Allium family which became the millionth specimen to be digitised here at Kew. Standing in this garden, surrounded by all the smells and the textures of all the different flowers, it's hard to imagine that any of this could be turned into something meaningful that you could study on the internet. But that's exactly what they're trying to do here. They're trying to take their over 8 million specimens that they've collected over the years and just turn them over to the scientific community. Alan and the team of digitizers are hopeful their work will improve the science around plants and climate change. It gives us an idea of which plants are going to be most threatened and may not survive. Quite often the actual species being used might not survive where it's currently going, but what, is it, what are its closest relatives? Could they be used? Are there features in those relatives which could be brought into food plants, for example, which would enable them to survive in, under different climates? So it really provides a sort of evidence base for understanding current use of plants, but also the future use. From Darwin's hands to the internet, in just a few months, Q will open a portal, meaning the whole world has access to their extraordinary collection. Mickey Carroll, Q Gardens, Sky News. Such an amazing resource there at Q, quite unique. Well, that's it for this week. Remember, you can catch up on all your climate and environment news on the Sky News website and app or by scanning the QR code that is on your screen right now. Next week, we'll be at the Goodwood Festival of Speed, seeing whether there's any chance that synthetic fuels could make engines climate-friendly. See you then.